Amen. What a wonderful service we had last night. Amen. I think we just need to give some praise and thanksgiving right now to Jesus just for what he did last night through Brother Duffy, through our worship and our praise. Let's just praise him. Let's lift up some glory to Jesus right now. We praise you. We thank you, God, for the lives that have been touched, God, for the message that we heard, God, Lord, and even for the encouragement and the warnings, God, that we are given from you, God, through your messenger, God. Help us to take heed, Lord God, to your word and to what you say, God, that we would hide it in our heart, that we wouldn't sin against you, and God, that we would draw nearer to you, God. Hear your word and keep it, Lord. We thank you. We love you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Well, welcome tonight. Another great opportunity to gather together. I know it's an off night. We don't normally have service on Thursday, but just another good opportunity to get together with Jesus. Amen? Amen. So just in a little thought and pre-service prayer here that I want to share. In Luke 21, Jesus begins ministering to people. And in verse 10, he begins to warn people to prepare for his second coming. Amen. For the rapture of his church. Amen. He begins when they ask about... Uh, these end times and he they said master when shall these things be and what shall be the sign that these things shall come to pass and he begins to encourage them and instruct them he says take heed that you're not deceived for many shall come in my name saying i am christ and the time draweth near go ye not after them and then he begins to tell about wars and rumors of wars nation rising against nation earthquakes famines, pestilences, fearful sights, great signs from heaven. And people will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues, to prisons, brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But then he, near the end of this, gives them some other, uh, just kind of another sign. And this isn't so much a sign of the times around you, of things happening to you from other people or uh, through natural disasters or things like this. He says, after he talks about the signs in the sun and the moon, he begins talking a little bit more personal and he says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. He's telling the folks in his day that there is coming a time that he's coming back for his church and these are going to be some signs that there's going to be troubles, there's going to be famines, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And then he said, men's hearts failing them for fear. I think that we live in a day where people are fearful. There are a lot of things they're not sure of. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what the answer is going to be. Am I going to get sick? Am I going to have enough of this product in my home? Or is it going to run out on the shelf? Is there going to be uh, this situation? Is there going to be a riot or a protest in my hometown? Is there going to be, a, a, you know, for, for this situation going on in the world, are these wildfires that are out west going to spread and get worse? What's going to happen? And men's hearts failing them for fear. And I believe that we're living in a day where people are fearful and they don't know where to turn. They don't know where to put their hope, but we know where to put our hope. Amen. We have a God that is an overcomer. He has already defeated the enemy. He has already told us what's going to happen in the end. He is victorious. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we can put our trust and our faith in him and our hope in him. Amen. Because when you don't know where to turn to, I could just tell you tonight, you can turn to Jesus and you can trust in the Lord God. Can you say amen? Amen. We've been talking about praying for our election coming up, and we should pray for our election. We should pray for kings and rulers and such, as the Bible says. We should pray for direction, but we should understand that that's not our answer. I don't put my hope in a presidential candidate for the solving of the problems of the world. Amen. I put my hope in Jesus Christ. Just because uh, we go through an act, just because we have some things that we do in this life, that's not where we're putting our hope and our trust. It doesn't mean we ignore them. It doesn't mean we don't participate, but it's where our hope is. And I think as the church, we need to be reminded of that continually, that our hope is in Him. 
our trust, our faith is in him. It's not in whoever my employer is to give me a check, but he's my provider. It's not in whoever my health care advisor is, but he is my healer. It's not in whoever uh, my, my where I go for my education, but he is my teacher. Amen. Again, we need those things, I understand in life, but it's really where we put our hope and our faith and our trust. Psalms 20 tells us that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Doesn't say there's anything wrong with owning a horse, nothing wrong with riding in a chariot, nothing wrong with using them when you go to battle. He wasn't saying you shouldn't have that. But he's, what he's saying is you can't put your trust in it. It's not about how big or how great your chariot is or how many horses you have or, or your army or your manpower. It's about your God power. It's about who we really understand and realize that we can put our faith and our trust in. So tonight as we go before the Lord in prayer, I want us to pray that God would help us to continually put our faith and our trust, all of our hope, in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, God, that you are God. I thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne, God, that there is nothing too difficult for you. Lord, that you see all, that you know all, that you have the answer for everything that we need. Lord, help us. Yes, Jesus, there's things that we have in our life, but God, we want to put our hope and our trust in you. There are tools that we use and resources we have at our disposal, but God, you are the one that we need. You are the one that we trust in. You are our hope and our strength. God, you are the answer for everything that we have need of. So as we pray for direction, as we pray for instruction, as we pray for understanding, God, that you would lead us and guide us, whether it's in our voting or whether it's with uh, situations in the world around us or decisions that we have to make, we understand those things are necessary, but God, it's not where I put my hope. It's not where I put my faith or my trust. But that has to be in you, Jesus. So tonight as we enter into a time of worship and praise and receiving of your word, God, I pray that you would help us, God, tonight once again. We have wonderful musicians, wonderful praise singers, an incredible man of God to deliver your word. But our trust tonight isn't in any of those things. It's in you, God. We understand you're going to use Brother Duffy tonight. You're going to anoint him, God, with your power and your spirit and your word, God. So help us to put our trust in you for those things. We understand, God, you're going to anoint, Lord, Sister Kaylee, Brother Ryland, our musicians and our praise singers. But, God, our trust is not in them. It's in you, God. We need to turn our eyes and our heart to you stronger and more than ever before, Jesus. Because we need you. We have our brothers and sisters here tonight. This is the family of God, the church, and we certainly need each other. And this is your plan, and it's a perfect plan. But God, we put our hope and our trust in you. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. Have your way in this service tonight. Be glorified in everything that's said and done here. And let it all be done, God, for your glory and in your name. And everyone said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we worship tonight, we're going to invite our ushers to come. Another opportunity to give, to worship God, to support this week. Amen. We appreciate each and every one of you. Amen. As we've said multiple times, I realize that, uh, you know, in our county, things are changing a little bit. Things are escalating. And, you know, that doesn't come as a shock to us. We know that 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 can happen, but we still trust in God. So if you're watching from home and you wonder, you know, I want to support this, I want to be a part of it, we have multiple ways to give. You can mail it in to P.O. Box 123. We've mentioned this all throughout our um, our online services, and when we had to go completely online, you can give through the Venmo app, amen, or you can drop it off here in person. But we want to, we want to be blessed. We want to bless God, the kingdom of God. Amen. And the word of God so that we can continue to do his will. Amen. Amen. Please remember, we do have service tomorrow night. Same format, 630 prayer, 7 o'clock service.
And I want us to invite somebody to encourage somebody, to remind somebody, to text them, to email them, to send a carrier pigeon, a smoke signal, whatever you got to do. Just get the word out. Amen. Because God is doing incredible things. There was a wonderful ministry of repentance here last night. Amen. And the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice just over one that repents. Amen. Amen. So don't forget tomorrow night service. We're going to have a great time tonight. And then, of course, on Sunday, our morning service begins at 10 o'clock. There will not be an evening service, but we're going to have Pizza Hut pizza catered in. And we invite everyone to stay and be a part of that. We're going to have, again, Lord willing, no rain or very light rain, maybe in the evening after we're done. But we're going to have games. We're going to have kind of all kinds of fun things to do and some food and fellowship. So be a part of that. Don't miss out. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Jesus, again, we thank you. We love you. Have your way in this service, God. Have your way with this offering, this giving, this worship to you, God. Anoint, Lord, our praise singers, our musicians, God. Anoint our hearts and our minds, God, just to give everything over to you in worship tonight, to trust in you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We thank you for the brother and sister Duffy being here with us for their ministry, God, for their example, Lord, God, throughout our fellowship, and for his anointing, God, for their, for their sensitivity to your spirit, God. And we ask that you would just have your way and help us to receive, God, tonight what you would say to your church. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name.
Let's lift up that name of Jesus tonight. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We worship you, God. We need you, Jesus. Your name is wonderful. It's glorious. It's powerful. It's all we need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I am once again tonight very excited and privileged to bring Reverend Tim Duffy to this pulpit from northern Indiana. Warsaw, Indiana. I've always said that. It's northern Indiana. I don't know. I've always said he's from northern Indiana. I heard somebody do this once and they got away with it. So, recently. Amen. Brother Duffy, God bless you. Come on and bring the word of God to us. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, glory. Good to see everybody tonight. God bless you for being here. And I'm glad you all got in the middle. <laughs> some of these uh, auditoriums, you know, I've seen some even more than this, you know. It's, I start preaching to one, and I go, wait a minute, i got to go over here and talk to everybody. Well, it's good to see you tonight. God bless you. You may be seated. want to say once again thank you to this church and brother schmitz for all your hospitality sister schmitz we appreciate it um it's really great to be with god's people and we've already been able to have some great conversations already so it's uh, wonderful to be able to converse about the scripture and the will of god and the word of god jesus the most interesting human being ever to walk on this planet. What a remarkable story. Jesus Christ lives and then he dies. They crucify him, they, they kill him and he goes into the grave. On the third day, he rose again. And then there was a section of time in the ministry of Jesus Christ that's um, incredible because he had 40 days after his resurrection that he spent on earth. So, you know, for us, we've got to think, you know, a month plus 10 days after his resurrection. He showed himself alive in many different ways to many different people. He proved that he was a, a true human being after his resurrection. He proved it. He ate. He ate with them. He showed that he wasn't just some sort of spirit being, you know. Jesus wasn't an angel or it didn't have that type of, uh, not type of a being. He was born of a woman. This is so important. Jesus was born of a woman. He was just like everybody else in the fact that he was flesh and blood. He had to sleep. He had to eat. He was just like us. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus was even 
tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So being tempted to sin, he never did. Why? Because of the power of God that he followed constantly. That flesh was in total submission to the will of God. That's important to understand about Jesus. He broke that barrier of living in the flesh without sin. That's a barrier that had never been broken before. Adam and Eve, flesh, tempted, succumbed disobeyed, sinned, okay? From then on, man sins because that's the nature now of the flesh. It's the nature. So that means when you're born, you will sin eventually because that's your nature that's your nature. That's what you gravitate to. If you've raised children, you get that. Because it doesn't take long, and you're like, how is this little thing trying to pull the wool over my eyes? It's trying to lie to me already. <clears throat> Surely I didn't teach him that. <laughs> Not that young. It's amazing how, as you raise children, you realize the nature is really a sin nature. That's why we must evangelize our children. Because if we think we're going to pass it on to them, just pass it on because we've got it, ooh, that's a huge mistake. Too many people think that that's how it works, and their children may not get it because they think, well, I am, so you will be. Oh, no. We have to evangelize our children. I remember my father telling me over and over, you need the Holy Ghost. You need <clears throat> to get yourself into a place of repentance, which means, you know, you don't want to live wrong and be baptized and be filled with the Holy Ghost. <coughs> so our children need evangelized don't think that they're just going to get it by osmosis just sit around and it kind of leaks into them you know so that's a, a word to all of us that are parents raising kids and also maybe in the future this row might be raising some kids <coughs> and one of these days you'll have to say well I got to preach to my child you need to be born again and let them know Jesus broke the barrier of living in the flesh and not sinning. Jesus broke the barrier of facing Satan face to face and not being fooled. That's another barrier. See, Jesus was in the flesh, right? Yeah, he had flesh and blood, but what was it that caused he even said here's what here's what I do I always do the will of God he said even the words that I speak are not just my own what did he mean by that they're not just fleshly words from a fleshly mind the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Only means nobody else. This is the only flesh of God. Jesus Christ is Almighty God manifested or revealed to the world as Savior of the world. 
God had never revealed himself as Savior of the world until Bethlehem. And he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of his government, there shall be no end. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Woo! <clears throat> Jesus faced Satan face to face in the flesh, and he was the first human being to not be fooled by the lies of the devil. After he was in the wilderness, you know, for 40 days, 40 nights fasting, he was a hungered, and Satan met him face to face and tried to hoodwink him, we could say, or tried to fool him or deceive him. That's because that's the devil's only thing that he can do. That's his only power. The only power of the devil, Satan, is deception. It's it. He's never forced anybody. Never forced anybody. He tricks people. He didn't go, Eve, whop, grab her, throw her down on the ground, pin her with one arm, I mean with one coil, and take uh, the fruit off the tree and shove it into her mouth. Come on, that's not what happened. He talked to her and deceived her. We know because after it was all done, God came and spoke to her. Why have you done this? He tricked me, she said. Why did she say the devil tricked me? How did she know she was being tricked? Because she was standing in the presence of the voice of God. And when you're in the presence of the voice of God, there is no deception and there's no devil that can do anything when the word of God is being preached and taught. That's your moment. That's the world's opportunity. The world only has an opportunity for salvation is when we have the responsibility that we have and with the obedience that we have to stand up, open our mouths, and speak God's word into our community. That's the moment that darkness flees, that's the moment that everything is dispelled. I've watched it and so have you. I've taught people before, I've preached to people, I've been with people and I've shared the word of God with them. I could see in their countenance that they were getting a, a revelation and understanding, their, their eyes were being opened. And the next thing you know, you can see them then wanna go back to their carnal thinking. They should have seized the moment and they missed it and they went back to their own thinking Jesus broke the barrier of meeting Satan face to face in the flesh and he overcame him the Bible says after the temptation in the wilderness the devil left him for a season then Jesus Christ broke another powerful barrier he went to the garden of Gethsemane at the very end of his ministry and he begs God we're talking about the flesh now the flesh is begging for self preservation he's saying let this cup pass from me what's that mean let this cup in other words I do not want to drink of the cup of death we have to get that Jesus was in a very, very deep depression. The Bible says he was. If they would analyze him today on some couch, they would have said, this man is in deep clinical depression. I mean, he's a mess. 
He's writhing on the ground, sweating, <clears throat> begging into the air. You guys ever read that? Did you guys read that in your Bible, that Jesus was in great agony? Sometimes we've romanticized all these stories, and we need to bring them down and really look at them. If you saw him on this floor as he was in, gar in the Garden of Gethsemane, it would be revolting, scary, worrisome. You'd be like, what's up with this dude? Let this cup pass from me. Matter of fact, the scripture is very clear that he did it three times. He was in agony. Why? Because he was getting the sacrifice under control, the lamb. All through the Old Testament, anytime you had sacrifices being brought to the tabernacle or temple, they didn't all just line up and walk up there. You had to go Get the young bullock. <laughs> Missed. Oh, try a different one. You had to catch the bird. You had to get the lamb. You had to get the goat. When's the last time you just walked up to a goat and said, come here, goaty goat. You know, if you've ever been around goats. and How about sheep, you know? If you're not the shepherd, man, they'll scatter. I remember when I was a little kid. I used to walk out to the sheep, and I always watched my babysitter. Her name was Hilde. She'd walk out and say something. I don't know what she said, and they'd all come walking up, but they knew her voice. I'd walk out there. i go, come here, sheepy, sheepy, whatever, you know. They're like, like, who is this rambunctious little brat coming out here? He looks worse than a wolf. But if you're going to get a sacrifice, you have to bring it under your control. And you don't even kill it. You take it to the priest. So you've got to take it alive all the way to the priest. He kills it. Jesus satisfies, fulfills everything in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ had to get himself under control in the garden. And he said, for the last time, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. <clears throat> so Jesus was saying, they're not going to catch me. I'm going to surrender. Jesus broke the barrier of surrendering self, even to death. And they killed him. But he rose again. Jesus Christ was the first human being to break the barrier of the grave. First one, somebody might say, well, how about Lazarus? It was before that. But guess what happened with Lazarus? He went back. Not Jesus. This man came out of the grave and stayed out of the grave. He broke the barrier. Look at all these barriers that Jesus has broken. Who did he do that for? Me and you. He showed us how to walk in the flesh, live in the flesh without sin. He showed it. Denominational False Christianity doesn't teach this. But we do because we know the power of the Holy Ghost infilling. It's the divine nature, not the old sinful self nature. Woo! Jesus has taught us to get ourselves under control and to present our bodies 
a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Paul went on to say, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. By the renewing, that means the regeneration of your mind, that you may show or prove the will of God to the world. Jesus broke the barrier of, of living in the flesh and living without sin. He broke the barrier of dealing with the devil and not being fooled. He went to the grave but came out of the grave. He broke the barrier. When he was on the cross and he finally died, the veil in the temple, the partition, the barrier, the barrier tore. The writer of Hebrews says he equates the flesh of Jesus to the veil in the temple, the barrier. We have much to thank Jesus for. He's a barrier breaker. And then he says, now I'm going to provide for you a way to break the barriers yourselves. Jesus Christ came out of the grave, broke the barrier. Jesus Christ stood after 40 days on Mount Olive, and all of a sudden... He got on an invisible elevator. And the elevator invisible, it took him up and the clouds received him out of the sight. He just broke another barrier. The first human to be caught up First one, to be caught up. We've got to get specific here because you're all thinking Elijah. He's the first human being to be caught up to the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So there he is, and he said to his disciples, he said, you know what, guys? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I don't leave, the Holy Ghost won't come. So Jesus broke the barrier of a human being going into the holy city, and he made a way for us. 